Backpack Broadcasting continues to bring you the best original sports content, but now you can get more of the content you love. For as little as $3 a month, you can get access to bonus content, including behind the scenes footage and interviews from the Sports Walk, Sideline Stories, or the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast. All this exclusive content comes via Patreon. There are tiered levels of patronage, and each Backpack Broadcasting patron receives exclusive perks. Your support helps Backpack Broadcasting create more of the original content that you love. Visit Backpack Broadcasting's Patreon page and become a patron today. Dexter Henry, Brian Fonseca here, and uh-huh. we have a first-time guest, good friend of the show, been trying to get her on for a while, but we made it happen. We finally made it happen. I haven't seen her in a long time. This is the first time I'm seeing her in a while. Sarah Same. Kustok, uh color commentator for the Yes Network. You see her doing all the Yes games. She does a wonderful job. Known her since she was a sideline reporter. Sarah, what's up? How you doing? Seeing your two faces totally <laughs> brightens my day. I am honored and humbled to be on. I also, Dexter, you got you haven't been trying to get me on for that long. Now that we just yeah. the long, you went through a laundry list of every friend I have, which isn't that long, <laughs> but has already been on the pod. You're at episode one forty six, and and I did it. I did it. I'm honored, happen. but I also feel like you may have went through the whole list. You know what? I have to be honest because before we have to show you on for a fifth time, maybe. <laughs> maybe. So maybe you know what? I have to be Sarah honest. Spe- speaking of our friend Michelle, Michelle, I think it was the first time Michelle was on. Michelle said to me, oh, Dex, you have to have Sarah on. You have to have Janae on. I know you know them both. You have to get it done. So it's a failure on my part for not You have it done. you. Okay. All right. Well, Janae will be me. next after me. But I am, I I really <laughs> am. I'm thrilled to be on. And both of you, it's, it's good to see your faces. Brian, I've seen a little more recently than yes. you, Dexter. Brian, sure. Brian's been around the Nets a little bit more than I have recently. I like it. So, so it's good. How are you doing uh, through these times? How's everything going for you? Doing well. No complaints on my end. Um, what everyone has endured and is enduring and the impact that this has had across the country and globally, I, I have zero complaints from my end. My family, friends, happy, healthy, um, and hanging in there. So all good. All good. Thank that's you. Hope, hope to both of, to both of you and your families as well. Hopefully that's yes. the same. All is well, yeah. happy and healthy, uh, staying positive as much as we can. Um, so that's, that's really it. Glad you are well too. Brian, you doing good this week? Doing all right. Uh, I actually got back from my brief vacation in PA that I told you about, Dex. Three days. I didn't uh, hear about this. Rare because I'm not the vacation person because I feel, like, be <laughs> I feel like I got to earn it, you know? But at the same time, after, you know, we're just home. So it's like I need to see something else. So I just went out with some people to PA, uh, spent three days there. Um the third day, there were a little bit more people than I thought would show up to this party we were having. Uh, but as far as I know, everybody's been all right and in the clear so far for, you know, reasons that I'm going to just leave right there. <laughs> I had a lot of burgers, though. Burgers was good. You know what I mean? Moro, all that shit. Like, I was, I was chilling. <laughs> I, I'm glad that in the midst of the pandemic, that's when Brian decides it's time to start vacationing. Yeah, hey, there. I guess he got that annoyed. <laughs> I, well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I was invited. Didn't think I could make it work. And this was in PA, so it was a short car ride. I'm not getting on a plane yet. No. I'm not going through that yet. You no. know what I mean? Like, like Florida. No, well, Florida. <laughs> but, like, any other place or whatever. Like, I wanted to go to Canada this year, Sarah. I was telling Dexter this. I wanted to go to Canada in August. Uh, obviously, you know, they don't want us over there for obvious reasons. And, you know, they shouldn't because, like, we're all infested over here, apparently. Yeah. Um, <laughs> We don't know Wait, have things. you been to Canada before, though? Never, and I want to. So 2021, I'm hoping that I could do yeah, a Toronto, to Toronto, Montreal. Montreal, Montreal. Montreal. I've been telling Montreal. them to go to both. I to yeah, I, I want to go. Oh, I want to go out there, there for like. Yeah, Brian, I want to go out there for like go, maybe. You were gonna go to Brian. You were gonna go to Montreal, right? Montreal and Toronto. And Toronto I wanted okay. to do like a few days in each city. Check it out. You know, see what I see. I actually know a couple people in Toronto, so maybe link up with them, and then yeah. But hopefully 2021. Hopefully 2021. Toronto. 
I know this isn't what we're trying to talk about in the podcast, but Toronto is one of my favorite city whenever we're on our NBA travels. Um, I love Toronto. Montreal is great. Yep. Uh, we were there for a global games two preseasons ago, I believe. Oh, sorry. Um, gorgeous. But when I was covering the NHL, um, I had a playoff series in Vancouver. So spent mm. a good chunk of two, three weeks there. And it w- it's one of my favorite favorite places um so you gotta you gotta get to you gotta yeah get to I, I, def- I, mean, I definitely want to i definitely want to and you know depending on how november goes i might go there permanently so we'll see you know what i mean <laughs> we'll see all right sarah sarah before we get into some net stuff uh whenever we have someone new on the podcast we have to ask them about their background how they got into especially with their journalists we always like how did you get into sports journalism broadcasting so if you could tell your story for a little bit for the listeners how did you get into uh doing what you do you would you would think by this time in life I would have a good succinct way to actually tell this story, um, and I never tell it the same way because there's only one way to tell it, and we don't have five hours to sit here. It, it's I I will say to try and keep it brief. Um, it was an absolute winding path that took me in a variety of different directions. I never had any intentions to get into broadcasting or you know get into really necessarily journalism. Um, While I was in college, I had majored in communications, minored in sociology. I ended up starting grad school um, my senior year of college, finished my fifth year, but my master's was in corporate multicultural communication. So I always loved to research, to, to speak. I enjoyed writing was my passion. And long story short, while I was finishing up grad school, I had met some individuals who had worked for ESPN. I started just being essentially like a runner for the Big Ten um, college football games on weekends while I was still working during the week and um, taking some night grad school classes. And long story short, I, I saw how a production was actually put together, sitting in the production truck um, at that time of of a college football game. I think, you know, whether it was Michigan or Wisconsin or you name it, it, it was electrifying to me. Um, and those were the first moments I realized, wow, the opportunity to potentially do this is something, um, that I just absolutely wanted to pursue throughout the course that I started doing, as you guys know, the past of, of so many broadcasters, journalists, um, whether it's, you know, with high school games or, doing some, a lot of it started actually in the analyst role, um, calling Illinois State High School championship games, um, some women's college basketball games. So fast forward, some of those opportunities led to others in Chicago. I was born and raised in Chicago, played basketball at DePaul. Um, So that parlayed into some other opportunities, just given my sports background. Uh, And it it was a circumstance of a lot of freelancing, one opportunity leading to another uh, you never really knew, you know, when that next opportunity would come. But it, as you guys know, a lot of grinding, a lot of hard work, um, and yeah. and you know, eventually la- landed me here. And it, it was um, it was something. I think the bottom line of all of it, just the opportunity to grow, to be challenged, and be around sports, was something um, that has and continues to be an absolute dream. That was good. That was a good story. You, you put, I think you put it together. I know, but it was longer than, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so like, you know, I always remember every job, though. They're like, okay, can you can you give us, you know, just kind of like a bio of the places you worked? I'm like, it would be <laughs> short if I just said where I didn't work. Right, right. <laughs> was like every station, every place, every sport, every everything. And I think that's the beauty, as you guys know. Yeah. Um, my passion's in, in in basketball and with the NBA. Um, I get an opportunity now still to do some NFL um, you know, I'd covered baseball, covered NHL, hockey, but doing those different sports, whether it was indoor lacrosse, whether it was the MLS, um, you know, the list goes on just kind of trying to refine the way in which you do television by learning those sports, sports and learning those, uh, you know, the different nuances for each game. I think it is so important in how it helps us to develop and become better. Oh, no, no doubt about that. And it's funny in listening to you say all that, I finally realized it's like we have now completed the trifecta of the Yes Network Nets uh, broadcasting crew. We've had Iron Eagle, we have had Michael Grady, and we have now had you. So it's it's, it's complete now. We're That's gorgeous. very exciting. Yes. Well, I will, well, I'll, well, I'll, I'll say this, sorry, Brian, I'm going to cut you off. I am not nearly as funny as Ian, and I'm not nearly <laughs> as cool as Grady. 
So <laughs> I don't know what I bring to the table with this trifecta, but um, but no, they're the best. You know, we're so lucky to all get to work together. Yeah, you guys are great. Yeah. Well, we we've we've been trying Ryan, but he keeps forgetting. You know what I mean? Well, like, we'll, we'll do, you think, do you think he, he feels? Do you think he feels some competition with his R two C two podcast? That it may divert uh, from some of his listeners. I, I don't know. I don't know. It, I don't know. Not, maybe. I mean, he knows us both. I mean, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. I'm I don't teasing. know. I think it's. I'm teasing. I doubt it. I, but he'll, I, he'll, he'll, we'll, we'll he'll get him. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get him on. We'll, and then we'll we'll complete the quartet. We'll, we'll get. We'll get. Him I on. love we'll, it. We'll, we'll we'll get that. We'll get that done. Hey everybody, Brian Fonseca here to tell you about the multi-time award winning series Out Now that is Side Hustle, which is created, executive produced, hosted, and edited by me, Brian Fonseca. Side Hustle is a sit-down interview series that taps into sacrifice, the odd avenues taken to progress closer to your ultimate dreams, and some jokes as well. Because you know, we always gotta find it funny and we always gotta find time to laugh. Side Hustle has been named to the best TV and web series category at several different film festivals, including the 2020 International New York Film Festival, the New York Movie Awards, and a host of others. Be sure to watch season one in full right now on either BrianFonseca.net or YouTube.com slash Brian Fonseca. Brian with a Y, remember. All eight episodes, trailers, teasers, and promo are free to watch, and the series as a whole is approximately two hours long. Everyone has a story. Everyone has a side hustle. Be sure to watch season one, out now. Sarah, obviously a lot going on with the Brooklyn Nets. Uh, New head coach, Steve Nash, uh, was announced officially uh, earlier this week at a press conference where we heard the news last week. When you heard the news about Steve Nash, were you as shocked as most people were? Because a lot of people didn't see this coming. came out of nowhere. What did you think? I had no clue. I think, as you know so often, um, with our positions, there's information you know or you hear about or things that you know you kind of have wind of or background of that I can't necessarily publicly say. Um, I, I checked my phone like 10 times when I, I first started seeing some tweets um, the text messages. And I even saw from like the Brooklyn Nets PR, the announcement. And I'm like, this just doesn't even feel real. Um, you know, for so long, I think we had some thoughts or speculation on some of the candidates or people, um, that the Nets may be looking at. And Steve Nash was certainly not on my radar, but, um, I was thrilled. I was excited, um, you know, in, in kind of letting it settle in and, and looking at the different pieces of it and the connections, uh, it, it appears like it will be a tremendous fit. Um, so yeah, but no, I did not. I, I was definitely caught off guard with that news. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, what do you, what do you think about his fit as a coach here? And, you know, there's a lot of things about, oh, well, he doesn't have any experience as an assistant coach. There's been a lot of talk about that. What do you think about this as a fit for the Nets at this time? I think early, I mean, obviously so much of what we're doing is just the, the early, you know, speculation and expectations on things that you never really know, regardless of if a coach has 20 years, that you know, the, if Greg Popovich was, was the one that you still never know how things come together and how things fit, um, given just timing and roster and personnel and the way things shake out. But looking at it, um, from this standpoint, I think so much focus is on his lack of quote unquote head coaching experience. I think it matters, you know, talking to a lot more people throughout the course of the last week and just listening to others speak those five years that he spent with golden state, um, as the basket, I don't know. I should know that correct I guess, title I guess basketball I operator advisor, yeah, whatever. But he, he was he was doing film work, you know. He was he was doing the film study with different players. We of course know his connection with with Kevin Durant, what he was doing on the practice court. But just get it, I think being so entrenched within an organization in so many different areas to see how things function and the process you go about things. Um, I, I don't think it's as simple as just saying that they're you know the the entire lack of experience is there because I think in many ways. You know, for someone as as bright and smart, insightful and studious as he is, I can only imagine how much he gained from those times and from that experience. Tack on the fact, and I know he said it, but we were all saying it prior to that. There's nothing that can replicate having played nearly two decades in the NBA at the level that he did. Uh, so often we talk about point guards, and I think that's why 
you see the track record of, of some of those that we point to and look at, and some were successful, some not quite as successful, but players who made that jump from being, you know, finishing player and not having head coaching experience to getting those jobs and those opportunities, because so often we talk about point guards being an extension of the coach on the floor. And I think the way in which he ran the team, the, him being a hall of famer, uh, you can't duplicate that particularly with a, a roster that's laden with so many talented, talented players. Uh, and then I, I love that, you know, Jack Vaughn, I thought did an extraordinary job in, in Orlando. Um, the leadership skills he brings to the table, um, their ability to work together, but just the, the understanding of, of JV being able to be there and help along with some of those details and filling in some of the gaps. Uh, it, it really, it, it makes me excited. And I think, you know, just the, those type of qualities that Nash seemingly possesses and also his relationship with uh, guys like Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving, that's the utmost importance and the synergy between he and, and Sean Marks in the front office. I, I think all of those factors bode well for the hope that this will be successful. Yeah, and there were a couple of points that were made in the press conference. Um, not the whole, you know, thing about him skipping the line or whatever, because we actually talked about that last podcast about how we feel about that. But uh, in relation to this first point where he says he didn't talk about this specifically with Kevin Durant before taking his job, I, I don't believe him. I'm just going to say that. I don't believe him at all. I just think I would think it would be irresponsible to just believe that, quite frankly, that they didn't talk about this at all before he took the job. Um, do you have any potential information on that, on, you know, what possibly could have went on there? I have no information to share. I have not talked to either Kevin Durant or Steve Nash about this, um, nor anything. But, no, I, I don't know, and I think um, – you know, to your point, does that probably surprise? Yes, whether it's it's entirely true or not. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. And those are some of the details that I think, you know, in, in these early stages and as we start to break things down, um, you wonder, you look at, is it going to matter in two months or a couple months or whenever this, you know, 2020, 2021 season right. is going to start? Probably not. You know, I think I think just the fact that um, that the trust and the knowledge and the buy-in of at this point of someone like Kevin is there, um, which clearly it is, is the important part of that. But yeah, I, I've got, I got nothing for you, Brian. Sorry. And, uh, and the second point, uh, he called Kyrie Irving, one of his favorite players of all time, not just in general, but like of all, like ever. And this is Steve Nash. So what <laughs> do you make of that, like that sort of relationship, how that could play out? Because obviously, you know, we've talked about Kenny Atkinson in the past having a point guard friendly system. But the reason why people have point guard friendly systems it, in large part is because of guys like Jason Kidd and Steve Nash. Uh, he said that he trained Kyrie for a couple of days in NYC, spoke to him. He's excited to develop that relationship. Just what are your thoughts on how that dynamic could play out? Because it's it's very it's a very important one, arguably the most important important one in terms of whether or not they can get to a championship is that Steve Nash and Kyrie Irving relationship. Yeah, Brian, I mean, you're, we were joking about the notes we took of things that maybe stood out during the press conference. And to <laughs> me that did. And I went back because at first I was like, which still would have been impressive. But I was like, did he say one of his all time favorite point guard? No, he said one of his all time favorite players. players. And the words that he used are what stood out to me most. The one being creativity the skill set. Um, I can't remember all the, but they, to think about the fact, and you bring up both Nash and Jason Kidd and the thought of them as, but they are savants and their understanding of just how to absolutely pick apart defenses. Um, and the forward thinking of just seeing the game develop and with someone like Kyrie Irving, I mean, we, we only saw glimpses, or not quite as much as we would have liked to last season. But the one thing I took away from last year and watching him, and I knew how talented he was. I was thrilled to have an opportunity to think, man, we get to see this guy every night and call it seeing him on a near nightly basis. And, you know, for how much that we did prior to the injuries, uh, it was mind blowing because you watch just the way in which the rhythm that he dances with the ball and how he's able to see things on the floor and cut through defenses and finish in a row, like all the stuff, the shooter that he is. I continue to be wowed 
with his type of talent. And so to think about those two guys together and how they could bounce ideas off of one another in the understanding that Steve Nash, he was in those shoes. He was in that position. He had that type of talent. This is a two-time MVP, a Hall of Famer. Um, I, I think there is there are a few things more important than that on top of the fact that the other thing that stood out to me with the press conference in relation to this um, – Steve Nash, and I, and I don't think he was saying it just to say it, it, it felt sincere and from the heart. When he was talking about Kyrie, he also closed by saying just the person, the, the generous acts and the way in which he was giving back to the community off the court. WNBA, um, when he was talking yeah. about the, the WNBA, we know all the countless, you know, amount of things that he, he's done that we, we publicly know. And also, I think there's even more that he's done privately just because he's doing it because he's doing it out of the bottom of his heart. Steve Nash talked about Kevin Durant and the the person that he is and who he is, not just as a basketball player, because I think it was um, after a question was posed about Durant still wanting more or searching for more, but about wanting to grow as a person. I think the the character and the personality of Steve Nash, just having outside interests and, and um, different perspectives on things and, and the ability to not just be singularly, narrowly focused on basketball, but focused on other things, a creativity aspect that comes in. I That's why I see so much connection as well. Um, and not to say that there's not other individuals that have that, but especially when it comes to Kyrie, that ability to connect on different levels um, and that type of understanding that it's more than just, you know, I know Kyrie Irving so important to him about it is more than just what I do with the basketball on my hand. And it feels to me like there is a common understanding of that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think I, I, there's a lot of things like that, just the those type of, um, you know, basketball minds, but also minds of creativity that ha have other interests, I think are going to be really important for the relationship and what they become. Sarah, when you, when you look at coaches right now in 2020 and you look at this team, specifically the Brooklyn Nets, they have two, two, a superstar and a star, two superstars, whatever you want to say. And there are championship aspirations as we knew were going to come, especially in this coming season. How much important is it to have a coach, which I think Steve Nass is being asked to do to manage these superstars and manage, you know, it's not just the X's and O's. It's, it's somebody you kind of mentioned about that connecting with the players. Is that kind of what we're looking for in terms of coaches now? And maybe this is the way we should sort of look at this Steve Nash hire as somebody who can relate to and also coach these players because he's done it before at a very high level. Yeah. I mean, I think we, I think we, as we look at it as the media, as fans, I feel like we just always want everything. And there's such high expectations on what a head coach is supposed to offer. And it, when you look at the, this is a player's league and this is a superstar driven league. So part of it is, is yes, that connection and managing personalities. And I believe in a, in a um, interview Sean Marks gave to Woj, he had, he'd spelled out the important factors um, that, Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving had said, and Dexter, you're nodding your head, you know, about um, the respect level, communication, yep. and I'm, I'm missing the, what the third factor was. Um, but to me, that's folded in. The, the idea of respecting someone, um, the idea of your ability to communicate and communicate what you want and what you need. And even for this group, you know, with someone like that, he – I keep going back to this press conference. I didn't think there was that much stuff I was going to glean from it. And, <laughs> and now, um, but he, but he, he was asked a question of, about handling superstars, the relationships. Um, I believe our friend Tim Bontemps asked it in, in saying, did, did having played with or been around, you know, X, Y, Z players help you have that type of experience as you enter, as you enter into this, um, to this role. And, and Steve got a look at like he, he thought about it and he looked at it and I think his the beginning of his response is like well I don't look at those guys that way like they're my friends and to me there was this blinging light of like he is a superstar he is a superstar too so he's not looking at how how gosh how am I going to manage these superstars now that are that I'm coaching on he he is one with all of that so I think that's why. Um, his ability, yes, to, to manage different players. And it's not just for as much as we're talking about Kevin and Kyrie, 
It's about the entire roster. How do you get everyone to buy in? And how do you make sure everyone understands their roles? How do you get everyone, if you're really talking about contending for a title, how do you get everyone to be their best to fit into this broad picture? Um, but you can't overlook that there are still the same requirements that everyone expects okay, you better be able to drop a good play or you better be able to, whether it's substitution patterns or timeouts or what you're running. I mean, there's so many things we see um, that you still got to be able to handle the X's and O's. And that's where I think the coaching staff as a whole comes in. Um, the development of guys, how do, you know, for Kevin and Kyrie, I think the opportunity to actually learn and, and to get better and to improve their games. Um, so while I think, you know, you focus on his ability and if he will bring a certain level of um, that cachet, that respect to be able to relate with different guys. I also think there's so many other factors. That, and that to me is where I think the experience of having played as a superstar in the league for 18 years or so, um, you've been through it, you know what works, you know what doesn't work, you know the different personalities of different guys, you know how important you know, the 12th guy is the, you know, whoever it is on the roster. Um, so again, those are the type of things that I think there is a different level of expectation and um, optimism for why he may be able to slide into this role. I was glad you mentioned that, that Woj interview with Sean Marks, because something that stuck, stuck, stuck out to me in that interview was Sean said that Steve treated when his time in Phoenix, those two seasons they played together, he treated the superstars, the guys like Amare and Sean Marion that he played with the same way he treated Sean, who was like the 15th guy <laughs> on that roster, right? The last guy on the bench. And that, even though they have a connection through there, that really st stuck out to me. Sarah, I have to ask you this before we let you go. Now, this we, we've talked about the championship aspirations. We know that this this team has, and they've gotten to a certain level. We, You and I and Brian have all been around the Nets, and they've built up the culture. We had all this talk about that. How much pressure do you think is on this team uh, next year? And what do you think they need to do to get to that championship level? Because there still could be work to be done. There's talk about possibly trading for a third star. What do you think this team needs to do to reach the mountaintop? We've all been around. Are you? Did, did any part of you have flashbacks to that Sports Illustrated cover? Um, oh. With Garnett and, oh. and is uh, who wants a piece of this yes. or us? Do you remember yeah. that? Do, do you remember that press card, <laughs> the introductory press conference? I yeah. do. Yes. I do. <laughs> I know that's not where you're going with this. But I had to slide in for people to talk so much about it. But I'm like, they, that was, yeah, if hindsight, hindsight always matters. Uh, yeah. um, back to back to your original question. I I I don't know, and I'm I'm curious how much the fluidity, uncertainty, given the times of COVID, given what's happening with the league, how that changes things or affects things or factors into you know whether it's what's going to happen on, on the trade market or you know if if you look to move pieces. I mean, I think, and, and I don't know, and I don't have the answers to this and I think I could probably argue a point of of any which way about um you know the, the roster as it sits and what you want and what you're looking for um I, I think the one thing you know is that we haven't seen especially with Kevin you know Durant being out the this you know however many months um we haven't seen all these guys on the floor together we saw you know we saw small parts with with Kyrie and being able to play with Karis and, and Spencer but then you know with some of the injuries of Karis so I don't think we really know so I think a big part um whatever happens and it shakes out and whatever the roster ends up looking like as they enter into next season, I think a big part is just going to be, you know, the understanding that both of the, the two key components, Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving are coming off surgery. So it may take a little time. There may take some time for everyone to come together. You got a new head coach and a new coaching staff and figuring out style of play and understanding the pieces and how they all fit. Um, but I think just the talent is clearly there. And when you yeah. have the talent at the top, um, that is so important. And now the way the East looks and who knows how exactly it will, of course, play out the rest of this postseason, but look, going into next season, I mean, there's that to me adds more reason for optimists because there's no, you know, for what's happening with Milwaukee or, you know, how is Philly going to look? Boston, of course, they've got a lot of young, but, you know, how does that change the dynamic of things? Um, and again, heading it on paper, looking at the roster, looking at the personnel. That's why I think, you know, there's uh, many, many reasons for the Nets. I think despite the fact that, 
there may be some moving parts and maybe some, some, you know, time given to acclimate themselves and shake off some rust. There's a lot of reasons that those goals and, and those, you know, expectations that they have seem very realistic. See, and, and that's something that I've thought about where I'm, I'm struggling to see a world right now where Kyrie, Kevin Durant, and Karis LeVert, and Jared Allen, and Joe Harris, and Spencer Dinwiddie, like, how are they going to make that work? Not in terms of play style, but just by salary cap numbers. Joe Harris is supposed to hit free agency. We don't even know what that's going to look like because of COVID and Hong Kong. Uh, we don't know, like, how that stuff is going to affect the salary cap. Uh, Spencer Dinwiddie has a player option that he's obviously not going to exercise and probably offer free agency in 2021. That makes him... Uh, or his contract, the trade asset, and that makes him a piece that's going to be valuable to somebody. And Karis LeVert, they signed him to that extension, but it's kind of a team-friendly extension where they can move off it, when, you know, however they want. Tory and Prince's deal the same way. So I am I think that there has to be a trade at some point. I'm not going to ask who do you think they can get because we can, you know, go on for days about that. But, you know, is it crazy to think that we're just going to see a different team that we think we are at this point, even with COVID and all these things? Like, there's there's a high probability, for me at least, that Karis LeVert or Spencer Dinwiddie or Jared Allen, like one or two of those three guys may not be back. Yeah, and I, I don't know the answers to that, and I don't even have any, you know, true educated guesses, because to your point, there are so many moving factors you look at. You look at not only just, you know, the salaries and where they sit with that, but the different contracts. Um, looking at this group, you're not just thinking, I mean, you are, but about this season, but the next the next few seasons, how does that factor in? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would probably be more surprised. Um, I shouldn't say that. I just, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see changes, if we see some movements. Um, and not even because of the fact that, some of these pieces or players wouldn't be beneficial to a team or to a title team. Exactly. But just given the fact that there, there are a lot of really, really good assets that the Nets have. Um, and does it bode better for the Nets to keep them, to have them with this group or um, to try and move them? Um, so I think that's, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And that's why I think there's just a lot of different factors. That's why I'm curious again, back to the point, you know, whether it's COVID or whether it's just, you know, where the things sit, the salary cap, everything getting pushed back within the course of the league, how that factors in for not only this group, but also for other teams. And does that change the way in which the other, you know, other 29 teams try and move and what they're doing with their own rosters? It's going to be interesting. Yeah. One last thing before we let you get out of here, Sarah. We appreciate the time. Um, I know you've been watching NBA playoffs. We always still keep our eye on it, even though the, the Nets have been out. Uh, who did you pick at the beginning of the year to win the championship if you did make a pick? And who do you like based on what you've seen thus far in the playoffs to, you know, come up with the Larry O'Brien trophy? Who do you think is going to raise it? Do you want to know who I picked to win or who I picked in the finals? Oh, <laughs> give me both. Give me everything. <laughs> everything. Yeah, right. Give us everything. Yeah, why not? Uh, I know. I, I'm trying to, like, get away from, from some of the early things. So you hope that now that it's been, like, 10 years that people have forgotten. No, I originally I had originally picked a clippers box final. Okay. Um, obviously, so that's obviously, not happening. Because obviously, I'm already failing. Um, but but I did. And I, I also was optimistic that the Bucks, despite what happened in the postseason, I thought they would make the requisite changes. They'd grow, they'd learn, and that they, um, yeah, I thought that they would be the East winners. Clearly, that is inaccurate. Um, the Clippers is who I obviously picked to, to come out of the West, and that was my pick to win the title. I thought the Clippers would win the title. I'm still sticking with, I don't know. I can't, like, I, I, <laughs> What, Brian, you got the Lakers, don't you? Yeah, we both no, got the Lakers. What? We did. We both got the Lakers. However, I've been on the Miami Heat bandwagon oh, all season. Well I will say, <laughs> I, was, I picked, so I'm going to backtrack my recent picks. Every time we acquire new information, we can make new picks. We can. Um, I, had, I had picked the Heat to come up after seeing what had happened in the first round. Uh, I had had Miami over Milwaukee. In, in the in the bubble prediction. So that I picked. Um, I did think Toronto was going to be I, – I cannot wait. The game last night oh. was can't off wait for, the I can't wait for game seven Friday. Charts. And, and, uh, and on so top hyped. of that, and whoever moves on, they're only going to have two days rest uh, before playing Miami 
uh, in, ga- in in the Eastern Conference Finals, Miami, a team that like wears you out physically. <laughs> so do you do you think your Miami pick is looking good? But anyway, so I hit initially. Like if you would have asked me a week or two weeks or whatever these, um, I would I thought it was going to be Toronto, Miami. It's still I I don't know. I I feel like predictions. Sometimes I don't like to make predictions because then I just like to watch a game and just enjoy the beauty and the in the competition of it. Uh, but it's been cra- but I, I feel like the the competitive level in spirit and play and all of these guys I, I didn't know what to expect as everyone else um, going into Orlando and going into the bubble and it has been such a treat and so much fun to watch um, and I think I'm still sticking with the Clippers although I feel like it's always an awful awful uh, decision to bet against LeBron so I don't know I'm trying not to make those predictions anymore so I, w- I would I feel like that's a toss-up yeah, no, it's it's. But the, you're right. The but quality. wait, I real yeah. Real go quick, ahead. Though, sure. Does anyone, Brian, are you taking Miami to win the whole thing? Like, do you think yeah, there's going to be yeah, some yeah, major upsides? At, at this point, yeah. I just think at this point, I'm just taking the Heat over the Lakers. At this point, why not? Just just wow. go just go all the way with it. You know what I mean? That, see, Dexter, I hadn't even mentioned this before, but like, yeah, because I had I had Miami losing uh in the Eastern Conference Finals to Toronto before okay. the playoffs began. And early on in the season, I had said that I think I had them going to the Eastern Conference Finals and losing to Philly? No, Boston? I don't remember who it was. But I had them going to the Eastern Conference Finals. Now, at this point, I'm just like, there's, there, I'm just, why not? Okay. It's the bubble. There's okay. no home game. I also games. don't, you know I don't I mean? want anyone to lose. Like, if you toss a team, like, I was just about to say this about Miami, that I started thinking about Toronto, and then I kind of feel it. But, like, I just, there's so many teams and players and that I just love. Like, I can't get enough of it. No, I, get, I don't I get see it. anyone lose. I get but, it. Like, there's just the attitudes and the a bit, like, the shot making. And I, I'm i also fascinated, um, after all is said and done, to hear from different players and got how much they think in, in one way or another, not even say negatively um, or positively, but, like, the lack of fans, the, you know, a little bit of a sterile environment, but also just the, the consistency and continuity of being in the same place. And you get used to the rims. You get used to your lines of sight, the lighting, the atmosphere, um, all of those, the depth perception of things. Like, how much does that factor into the lack of travel? But like you say, I, I do think the fact whether you're traveling, not traveling, it doesn't matter if you're, you're going to have a you know a banger of a game and then two days later have to come out and do the same that is not easy that is not easy absolutely not and i i like you sarah i've been highly impressed with the level of play i was c- kind of worried that it might take a while and it didn't take as long as i thought in in the playoffs to get the high level of play and I, like, even the seating games were great I like the yeah. seating games were great yeah I yeah the, the level of shot making um and the defense is picked up we, we've seen some Good stretches of defense, like we even saw in Game Six, Boston and um, Toronto. Really good stretches of defense too, and some great shot making. So, the NBA playoffs has been fantastic. I I can't I can't complain at all. I, I don't even like you said. Who knows what's gonna happen <laughs> in the next couple of rounds into the finals? You, you couldn't call. I can't even say Brian's crazy for picking Miami to go all the way. It's not I can crazy. I can see it. I can, I see, can it. see it. They've been, the, they've been playing better than everyone else in the playoffs so far. Yeah. They it, just have. It has. And they got great they got great chemistry amongst all those guys. I mean, you could see it. The leadership of Jimmy Butler. Yeah. Um, they're built for the bubble. and Because yeah. they're built for the bubble. Jimmy Butler don't care. He's selling $20 coffee in the bubble. You know what I mean? Doesn't want to make friends. Like, they don't care. They, do. <laughs> they don't. It's good. Sarah, thank you. We appreciate oh, you we for giving, us, giving us some time. This. You have to come back on soon. So you, you can be a multiple-time guest. I, well, clear, since all of my closest friends have been on multiple times prior to me even coming on once, I feel I feel like Sarah's not Sarah's never gonna let this down for me. She's gonna text not, me and be like, Dexter, I'm when am I coming back offended. in 2024? I'm not gonna be offended. I can't wait to text Michelle you and tell her tell I her. finally text Michelle. Come on. Michelle's gonna then text me and say, Dexter, you should wait. Have got Janae Sarah. has been on, or Janae? Has Janae not has not been, been on. Been on. We're, we're okay. Work, we're, we're, At least I beat Janae. You beat Janae. <laughs> we're, we're, we're working on getting Janae on. It'll, it'll, it'll happen. But we know you're and busy. And Ruko. I'm going to work on Ruko. Pre- we appreciate yes. that. We appreciate that. Tell Ruko he's got it. We have to get the entire Yes family on. That's We, we love yeah. the Yes family. They love us back. So, you know, we, ha- we have to get that done. Sarah, be well. We appreciate you coming on and all the great work that you're doing on Yes and everything. I know you're busy and have a million things to do. But thank you so much for the time. Thanks to the both of you.
One time for your mind, interesting stuff going on this week in the world of sports, music, things of otherwise. Brian, what you got this week? It is time to talk about Canelo Alvarez suing the zone, whom he signed that monster contract for, if you remember not that long ago, 10 Mm -hmm. years and well over $300 million. And he's already pissed off because he wants to fight. and They're not trying to let him fight unless it's against whatever their definition is of a premier opponent. So uh, this, this story I'm pulling up from Steve Kim of ESPN, Canelo Alvarez files suit versus Golden Boy, Oscar De La Hoya, and The Zone over the record deal. Uh, filed a lawsuit Tuesday, so a couple days ago from when we're recording this, uh, in federal court against The Zone and Golden Boy Promotions and the CEO, Oscar De La Hoya, alleging that the parties have not lived up to the terms of, excuse me, an 11 fight, 365 million deal that was agreed upon in 2018. And Canelo, being Canelo, having all the leverage in the world, is suing them uh, for those reasons. He's seeking at least $280 million in damages. $280 million in hmm. damages. Say that again. Uh, according to the lawsuit, which is filed in the U.S. District Court for the uh, Central District of California, the complaint states that the lawsuit arises from the breach of the single largest contract in the history of boxing and one of the largest in all of sport. After extended discussions between parties, the zone offered to pay Alvarez and Golden Boy Promotions a fraction of the contracted $40 million license fee in cash and some to zone stock in advance of a potential IPO. However, the entire, va- the entire value of the package for about against another world champion was substantially less than Alvarez's contractual agree. And look, up here, we haven't really gotten into it like, gotten into it, and I haven't gotten into it on Twitter, like, the way that I really could. I've sort of just hinted at this, but uh, for those of us that have been around boxing or know the zone a little bit and know the inner workings of it, this this kind of stuff, we, like, it's, you see the smile on my face. It's been pending for a long time. Like, the way that they've handled business, you could tell from coming out the gate, and no disrespect, because obviously we shouted out Ryan Rucco on this podcast, and you know, we're trying to get him on and he's done work for them. So I'm not trying to disparage anybody who works with the zone. But the way that the zone has went about their business as a company, going out and getting people through agents and whatever the case may be and getting them uh, to cover boxing who don't really cover boxing. Again, that's not an indictment on any one or two or three people, but they're, they weren't getting a lot of boxing people to cover boxing. When they had boxing people in the building. That's a verifiable fact. Uh they also don't really, and I've killed them for this, they don't really put on interesting fights. A lot of the mm-hmm. fights that they put on are one-sided. You know, you don't always get the Amanda Serrano and Heather Hardy, you know, 50-50 matchup on the zone. You don't really get that often at all. You know, Anthony Joshua and Anthony Ruiz Jr. was a joke even before uh, the results of it because we thought it was going to be very one-sided and then it turned out to be one-sided in another, in another way. That people did not well, expect. Right. <laughs> Right, but that's one of the very few upsets that the zone has had. If you look at the vast majority of the cards, they haven't put on a lot of memorable boxing cards, and the way they go about their business suggests that you know they're not really about pushing the art form of boxing. They're about just pushing whatever business side, and that's what cannibalizes things like boxing and you know things that we know and love. Whenever decisions are made by people in power and people with money that have little to do with the art form and have more to do with just money, then this is what you get. You get bad management, bad decisions being made. And on top of that, like, you know, with the zone, the subscription, I think they want to hike it up. And now they're not putting on a lot of fight cards. And who are the marquee fighters who they really have? Are they just going to give us Triple G and Canelo again? Why don't they value Colum Smith the way that they should? Like, there's a whole bunch of variables going on here. And I credit the zone for helping uh, just hurt the sport of boxing. Also, and I haven't even mentioned this, the YouTubers. They've had YouTubers in main events. And I think Nate Robinson is going to fight Jake Paul on a car coming up. Or Logan Paul. Whatever fucking Paul it is. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Like, the, these, this is the kind of things that the zone is putting forward. Well, I mean, I think when you have business practice like this, this is a lot of the reason you hear people say boxing. You know, some people feel like boxing is a joke. And boxing has been a joke in certain points because of uh, business decisions by the sport. But also when you have an organization, a media entity like this doing this. And to be clear on what Brian's talking about... It's not even just in in the people who are fighting. 
There's also yeah. we know, and I ain't gonna it's throw not about the sport. I'm not right. I ain't gonna throw two of you on the bus and all this other stuff. We've known people who've worked in there and worked uh, with that company and have heard about things in the way they've handled business and who's keeping on. If you've been to any boxing events that the zone is looking look, working around, I will also go out to say a lot of the people who are working these events don't look like most of the people that are fighting in the ring. That should also be noted. And should be seen in that. And I, uh, we've been Brian and I have been at these events, so we've seen these things. Um, I, it was yeah. very stark to me at the last the zone event I was at, which was Triple G's last fight back in October of last year, yes, first week in October. At yeah, the at the Garden, yeah. which actually ended up being a pretty good fight. The card itself was kind of underwhelming, but yeah. um, you know, and at the time I was talking with somebody who worked for the zone and some of the stuff they were doing. And it, it, it's just they haven't done business in the right way. And so I think it is glaring what I'll say to the, with the point that Brian's bringing up. I think it does mean something. I think it does mean a lot when Canelo Alvarez is suing him for money. Now, will he get all the money and the damages that he's requiring? Who knows? Will they have to settle? If they have to settle, that doesn't look good. That's a lot of money. We also know that the zone necessarily hasn't been, uh, I don't necessarily, maybe they put a lot of money into what they've wanted to do with boxing, but I'm not necessarily sure it's been profitable for them. They have had some notable layoffs and things within the last year. So how they're running their business, are they putting the money in the right places? Are they valuing fighters? It's all fair to be seen. And if fighters are pissed off and your main attraction to who you have to even come and watch the zone is pissed off, not a good look, y'all. <laughs> not a good look at all whatsoever. All right, I'm going to talk a little hip-hop this week. Uh we have been asking, Brian's been asking, to talk to me a lot, well, we've been talking about this year. We know J. Cole is working on the Fall Off albums coming soon. He released two songs on the Lewis Street EP that came out uh, a little while back. Uh, that's supposed to be the first couple songs off the album. Both are really dope. Um, so we're wondering when that's coming. But the person everybody's been wondering about where this person is in hip-hop has been Kendrick Lamar. Um, I'm a known Kendrick Lamar fan. I'm also a known J. Cole fan. Can't wait. For, for, for both of them, uh, we had had some information with Kendrick that his next album was going to be a very rock-influenced album. Um, don't know what kind of rock, but somewhat rock-influenced in, in the sound. Thundercat had come out, uh, the guitarist had come out and said this. Kendrick and J. Cole in the last week have had some tracks that have leaked, that have hit the internet. I'm going to start with the J. Cole stuff first. The J. Cole track, um, it's called Javari. And was featured in his docu HBO documentary that came out before the For, For Your Eyes Only album. Now, I remember watching that documentary and being like, yo, there were a couple songs in there that I was like, yo, why did those not make the album? This song, Javari, was one of them. Uh, and it's a, it's a pretty solid song. And I have to listen. I only listened to it once, to be fair. But it's pretty solid in him sort of talking about uh, somebody getting caught up in the street life and, and sort of moving, moving through that. And it was really good. It's like a four-verse song. It's a very long song. Um, and it sounded, you know, it sounds finished, so it was done. And it's good. But, you know, always excited for some new J. Cole. Kendrick, on the other hand, three songs uh, leaked last week. One is called Guilty Conscious, and it is clear play of Kendrick doing different vocal sounds, kind of like Eminem and Dr. Dre's Guilty Conscious song. And it's kind of that, that same sort of play off of that. It's clearly unfinished. It's not mixed. Uh... I was like, kind of like, whatever, the song, I didn't really need a continuation of Guilty Conscious. Now, the other two songs he has, one is called Somebody, also clearly not mixed or finished. Kendrick doing a little bit of vocals in it, sounds good. But I want to talk about the third song that was released by Kendrick. This song is called Prayer. And I've seen some people say this, and I do, even th I do not think it's hyperbolic in any kind of way. I actually think there's some seriousness to this. This might be one of the best songs I've ever heard Kendrick write. I don't say things like that too easily, but it's a really good song. It sounds close to finish. I don't know if there's supposed to be a, a, hook, a hook. It's what you would probably consider soft rock or yacht rock in that sort of genre. Very light piano with a little guitar riff. Very, Kendrick flowing easily over this. But it's the concept of this song that really gets me. Um, I, I don't want to give away exactly all the details of it to, to spoil stuff for people. But what I will say is it, it talks about, Kendrick is kind of talking about the discussion of do we separate art from morality, right? And 
do we judge the art that's out there by the morals of the person? Now, we kind of heard Kendrick touch on this on Mortal Man. He talks about Michael Jackson and Dr. Martin Luther King, two people who actually mentioned again in this song in two different verses, but it's how he executes it that is really dope. The first verse of the song, I'll just say, the first verse of the song, he raps from the perspective of Michael Jackson, the song ABC that was released from Michael Jackson and the Jackson 5 in the 70s, getting a date. But he actually says the date in the song. And it's from that perspective and wondering how we then view Michael Jackson through the lens of somebody who's created this great art and all the other problematic things that were alleged around Michael Jackson involving children. The second verse is from the perspective of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech and all the great things that came with that. But as some people may know or may not know, uh, it's well known that Martin Luther King you know, was involved with seeing some other women on the side from Coretta. It's very well known he was dipping in different, you know, things and interests of different women beside Coretta Scott King, the great Coretta Scott King. But does it change the way we look at him and the words and the message that he might have had in the I Had Dream speech? In the third verse, Kendrick kind of brings it all together, kind of bringing up this larger question, do, are we able to separate the art from the morality? It's very well written. It's over a beautiful beat. Um, I think it's an excellent concept. In a way, I'm kind of mad I heard it. I couldn't resist, and I had to listen to it. I'm kind of mad. It's, I yeah, haven't yet. It so feels... No, yeah, so I'm intrigued me. to hear what you think about when you hear it. It sounds perfect for an album. It sounds perfect. It could be an album closer, but it's just beautiful writing. Um, Kendrick masterfully flows on this. The writing is just, is just brilliant. It's extremely poetic. Um, it's what you would expect from him, but it, it has me excited for whatever his next album is because when you hear stuff like this you're like oh, this got leaked or this is a throwaway or for whatever reason it got leaked sample clearances this happens stuff happens all the time for whatever or, reason or 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 it may have been intentional from someone in that kendrick lamar group to be like all right let's see what people think about this sort of rough yeah. cut that's yeah possible too. yeah that's stuff is all can has always been done in the game but uh it has me excited i definitely Think people should check that out if you don't check out the other two kendrick tracks i think it's fine because they're not polished or finished songs but javari by j cole that's out there you can find it uh prayer by kendrick both out there uh you know and it also brings up the possibilities we still like to see that j cole kendrick album i know i would so yeah. we we, we, we will see black hippie Nas and premiere probably jay and Nas. let's like let's this. let's 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 stop at that for one second because i'm brian just went right talked about something in what he just said that i said why not why not tack it on to this one for your mind brian sent me a link yesterday to a Nas um, interview a Nas interview with, with torre yeah. and Nas torre, doing now. Huh. yeah he's mm -hmm. doing a lot it was album time so he's, he's doing a lot torre asked Nas if he had. He asked him a couple questions, so I want to set this up right. He asked him, "Would they ever see a project with him a large professor?" I wouldn't mind seeing that. I'd be fine with that. He then Give asked, "Motives and I'm good." Yeah. <laughs> he then asked him, "Will we see a project?" Has been rumored for many years. Nas fans know this as long as me. Many years, him and Primo, and Nas gave a look <laughs> that is very similar to look Brian has on his face now, which is like, "Yo, I could say Put something." His yeah, I put his finger on his mouth. I could say something, but I wouldn't say something, which makes me think something is coming on the way. And I will have to say this. There's probably maybe five to seven hip-hop albums that I've been desiring for a long time that I'd really, really like to see. This is probably at the top of that list. If Nas does the album with Primo, I don't care if he puts anything else ever else out again. I don't. I literally wouldn't care. Like Nas, I want you to keep making music. I love you. I love you, my brother. But it doesn't even matter. I've wanted this for so bad. I don't think there is a literal better pairing of a producer and rapper than Nas and DJ Premier. I mean, Primo, everybody knows that's my favorite producer. I think him and Nas have made great music together. They do not have a bad song. They have fantastic songs over a variety of styles. I would love to see it. And also want to know, Brian, in other interviews, Nas has talked about working on another project that he can't talk about right now, that he's going to, supposed to follow this King's Disease up. And I'm wondering if it's the project with DJ Premier. Yeah. So I wonder that too. But also, right after King's Disease came out, I think it was that very next week, a video came out. And I sent this to you of him in the studio with Dr. Dre. Yeah. And Dre was like, Dre was, you know, Dre was doing Dre shit. 
and then you hear the verse, you hear the, yeah, you know, Dre is just one of one, legit one of one in music. And then you're talking about like Nas is there and you're hearing the verses, people in the studio, whatever, they're listening to what it was and the song sounded, sounded really good. You know what I mean? It was one of those. So I'm like, all right, so what, so it, it see, maybe Nas has his hands in a lot of things. He kind of hinted to Teray as such like, yeah, I'm, you know, I want to be more active again is kind of what he was saying, right? Like, he went away for a long time when life is good. I mean, he has some things to take care about, uh, take care of, uh, investments, obviously, and then the aftermath of him and Khalees' split. And then uh, Nazir came out in 18, which is really just an EP, and then The Lost Tapes was a compilation of old joints. Um, and then it's like, you know, King's Disease is really the first full-length Nas project in eight years. The first one that obviously took a lot of time to, and I know he loves the Nazir project, but that was the EP, so that's a different sort of category. So, you know, if we're going to get more Nas, and if he's going to keep aging the way he is and doing, you know, putting out projects as good as King's Disease for however many years, you know, then great. You know, obviously I'm going to be here for it because, and this is why I was so excited about King's Disease, because I don't know how many more albums we're going to get from these legacy acts because these guys could walk yeah. away at any point and the, be fine. The one thing I took from that interview, Torre, before we wrap, is I feel like it sounds to me like Nas wants to do a lot of these projects or intriguing doing these projects it, where he it locks like in. He has a bucket list, right? A locking in like with these producers. A yeah. A list of items he wants to get to. Like, I want to do a Primo joint. I want to do the Swiss Beats one, is another one they talked about. Large Professor. Me personally, I would love it if Jay and Nas were to get together for even if it's the EP, like six songs or whatever. Oh, I'm but I would for that. love if Jay Z and Nas could put that out as sort of like this super collab of arguably the two best to ever do it. I would love for that to happen also. But yeah. I don't, I, you know, I don't know what the likelihood. I, is. I mean, nothing surprising. I'd like to see it, but there should be there should be more to see. All right, so check out uh, the story on Canelo Alvarez suing the Zone, and check <laughs> out the unreleased. Uh, J. Cole and Kendrick Lamar tracks that are out now. We're gonna that's gonna be a wrap for this episode 146. We can't believe it. Sarah couldn't believe it either. We're already at that number. 146. That is the episode of the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast for Brian Fonseca. I'm Dex Henry. Until next time, y'all. Peace. Mm-hmm.